I mentioned in the first video that there are as many bonding theories as there are chemists, but there are two major bonding theories that we're going to focus on here, valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. In this video, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of all bonding theories and then dive into the specifics of valence bond theory, which was an early example of a bonding theory that has some shortcomings relative to molecular orbital theory, but has the virtue of simplicity. So, fundamentals of bonding theories. Remember the Schrodinger equation? What well, holds for molecules as well. Electrons in molecules must also obey the Schrodinger equation. Now, keep in mind that since we're talking about a molecule here, the V, the potential, is going to be very complicated because we're going to have Coulombic terms for for example, the repulsion between electrons on dif different atoms nearby. We're going to have nucleus-nucleus repulsion. We're going to have electron-nucleus attraction. So this gets very, very complicated, and there are actually a very large number of terms for even the simplest of molecules that we might look at. So this is a very difficult problem to solve. I mean, it was tough for hydrogen, right? It's downright impossible to solve analytically for multi-electron molecules, molecules that have more than one electron and more than one nucleus. So to get around this problem, different bonding theories approximate the solutions to the molecular Schrodinger equation in different ways. They use various simplifications and approximations to get at wave functions that are more or less right, that more or less satisfy the molecular Schrodinger equation. And in some sense, all bonding theories describe the positions and energies of electrons with, within molecules. For molecular orbital theory, we actually get out wave functions, size, and energies that are either very close to or exactly eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. Valence bond theory is one of the simpler bonding theories that makes the following assumptions. Firstly, Molecular orbitals are linear combinations of the atomic orbitals. What that means is to construct an orbital that applies to a molecule, we take the atomic orbitals and we use those as ingredients. That's why I have, I have this image of this chef here. There's almost like a cookbook nature to this. We take, for example, s orbitals and the various p orbitals of the atoms that are involved, and then we combine them and mix them together by scaling them, multiplying or dividing them by certain constants and adding or subtracting them to generate the orbitals of a molecule which are going to be generally larger and may appear you know between two atoms within the molecule something like this if we allow all of the atomic orbitals over the entire molecule to go into the mix well this gets computationally intensive and rather complicated right because now we might have an orbital that could span, you know, say, all five atoms in a hypothetical molecule with five atoms in it. We might have an orbital that could span, you know, all five atoms. Predicting that and, and understanding where it comes from becomes very difficult. And actually interpreting diagrams like this to get useful information out becomes difficult. So one of the key assumptions of valence bond theory is that only atomic orbitals on adjacent atoms can overlap. So in other words, when we mix together, when we make linear combinations of the atomic orbitals, we can only do it if the orbitals are on adjacent atoms. And there's good reason for this, because typically the wave function goes to zero at high r values, far from the nucleus, right? So it makes sense that wave functions are going to be largest, greatest in magnitude, close to the nuclei, and so only adjacent atoms will have simultaneously large values of psi for their atomic orbitals. Finally, the key insight and really the enduring insight of valence bond theory is that the valence atomic orbitals, the outermost shells, are most important for chemical bonding. The core electrons essentially kind of are along for the ride with the atoms and do not participate in bonding. It's the electrons in the outer fringes, which can overlap with nearby atoms, that are most important for bonding and the core electrons really don't have much of an influence over bonding, if at all. And valence bond theory, and in large part molecular orbital theory, neglect core electrons completely. So this is valence bond theory in a nutshell, and we can summarize valence bond theory by saying that valence atomic orbitals, or what we'll call hybrid atomic orbitals, which are actually pre-mixed atomic orbitals, we'll have good reason for pre-mixing these when we talk about hybridization 
here shortly, but either valence atomic orbitals or hybrid atomic orbitals on adjacent atoms, that's key, the atoms must be adjacent, overlap to form covalent bonds. And this idea of overlap really just means addition, nothing too fancy. It's we're taking the wave functions and we're adding them together to form covalent bonds. So this idea of orbital overlap is really important to understand for all modern bonding theories. Why is it so important to understand this idea of orbital overlap and what exactly do we mean by this? Well, let's imagine two atoms that are coming together. Let's call them A and B. And let's say that A is an atom that has two electrons within a p orbital. This could be something like carbon. Right within carbon's electron configuration, we've got 2p, say x2, 2py1, and 2pz1. So ignoring the py and pz orbitals, if we think of this as the px orbital of carbon, the 2px, it's got two electrons within it, right? And let's say we had another atom, b, with no electrons in its p orbital. A good example of this might be boron. Boron has an empty 2p atomic orbital with no electrons within it. When these two atoms approach one another, when carbon and boron approach one another, the two electrons in carbon's 2p orbital can overlap with the empty 2p orbital on boron, and in the resulting overlapped orbital, where we've taken the two and just added them together, just added their wave functions at every point in space, the thing we get has the two electrons that were originally belonging to carbon, originally belonging to what we called atom A and atom B, now spread out between the two nuclei. Each of the electrons now has more room to spread out in a bond between the nuclei, lowering their energy overall. The same idea applies if we take two atoms that are both half-filled, that have half-filled atomic orbitals. So if we again think about atoms A and B coming together, atom A brings its electron and atom B brings its electron and they approach one another, the resulting overlapped orbital, which is again just a sum of these two, nothing too fancy here, we're just adding up the wave functions at every point in space as these atoms approach one another, the resulting orbital contains the two electrons in a broader space overall. They have the ability to spread out and roam the space between the two nuclei to a larger degree. When we talk about molecular orbital theory, we'll build on this paradigm of adding orbitals together in a little bit. There are two ways that orbitals can overlap. We've seen the first way already, and it's called head-on or sigma-type overlap. It's called sigma-type overlap because the resulting bond that's formed has cylindrical symmetry and is called a sigma orbital or a sigma bond. Notice that the larger ends of the white lobes are overlapping in this final picture. This is why this is called head-on overlap, because the heads of the orbitals, the tops of the orbitals, are pointed directly towards each other. Both of these examples at the top of the slide correspond to head-on or sigma-type overlap. Orbitals can also approach in kind of a side-by-side -side fashion like this, where the densest part of the orbitals are not overlapping, but we still get some overlap. And this is called pi-type overlap, and it leads to the formation of pi bonds like you see here. In a pi bond, we have, if the two atoms are here and here, and the original A and B were here and here, we've got density mostly above and below the axis of bonding between the two nuclei. You can see that we have, for example, positive wave function up here, a negative wave function down here, and a node actually along the axis between the two nuclei. That's pi-type overlap. In class, we'll look at examples of molecular orbitals and see pi and sigma-type overlap actually built into molecular orbitals. So let's look at a couple of examples of this in addition to the general examples we just looked at. Hydrogen is characterized by a 1s orbital that has one electron within it. And so when we take two hydrogen atoms with their 1s orbitals and combine them together, allow them to approach one another like so, the covalent bond that results involves a larger combined wave function with both electrons within it, like so. Analogously, fluorine has a half-filled 2p orbital, and so we can imagine fluorine sitting at the center of this p orbital at the node, and another fluorine with its p orbital approaching. There's one electron in each of these, and as we allow the two of them to approach one another, we end up with a covalent bond between them, such that there's large density between the two fluorines, and we still have some density on the outside 
of the opposite sign, and both electrons are now sitting inside this covalent bond. So this is the picture painted by valence bond theory. First of all, we focus on the valence orbitals, right? I'm looking at the 1s orbital for the two hydrogens and the 2p orbital for the two fluorines. So we focus on the valence orbitals to generate bonds, and that's why it's called valence bond theory.